Hello, everyone. My name is Lionel Sandner from Pembroke Publishers, and welcome to our webinar tonight. Before we get started, I would just like you to know that Pembroke Publishers' head office is situated upon the traditional territories of the Wendat, the Anishinaabek Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the Mississaugas of Scugog, Hiawatha First Nation, Alderville First Nation, and the Métis Nation. And the treaty covering this area of land in Toronto, Ontario, is collectively known as the Williams Treaties of 1923. I would also like to acknowledge and thank the Wasanic people on whose traditional territory I live, work, and learn. The Wasanic people have lived and worked on this land since time immemorial. And I wish to recognize the significant contributions of Indigenous peoples across this land. We seek a new relationship with First Nations, Métis, and Inuit peoples, one based in honour and deep respect. And now I would like to introduce our speaker for this evening, uh, Cheryl Duquette. Cheryl is an adjunct professor at the University of Ottawa. Ottawa and her research focuses mainly on inclusive education. As Cheryl has taught with students, has taught students with exceptionalities in general education and in special education classrooms at both the elementary and secondary levels. And her research uh, currently around fetal alcohol syndrome dis disorder contributed to the understanding of the school experiences of students coping with this condition. As a workshop leader, Cheryl has worked with teachers in China, as well as Morocco and the Middle East, and where I'm going uh, next summer with my boys, Tanzania. So uh, Cheryl brings a, a wealth of experience uh, along with her new book, which she's going to be talking about. We're very excited about uh, having out uh, published now. So congratulations for that, Cheryl. And uh, it's great to have you here. And I will pass the virtual mic over to you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Lionel, and I am absolutely thrilled to have the opportunity to uh, talk with uh, you folks uh, this evening. And I want to thank you as well for taking the time from your busy lives to uh, attend this webinar. And I do hope you find it useful. The book, Finding a Place for Every Student, is about inclusion and working with all students in your class. And when we talk about inclusion, I mean social and academic inclusion. And I believe that it applies to not only students who have IEPs, but every student in, in your classroom. And social inclusion begins with the relationship between the teacher and the student and is built on trust. And trust that you will be caring, respectful, and positive about them. It involves other things as well, such as getting to know the student, which is a, a basic task that all students, um, that all teachers should be uh, engaged in. And social inclusion also involves peers uh, that value everyone and treat everyone with care and respect and empathy. And you might be surprised how much a teacher can do to promote social inclusion among peers for everyone. And the second part of inclusion is academic inclusion. And I have to say that in my experience, before you can't really start to work on the academics until that relationship, that core relationship between the student and the teacher is, is established. And then you can start working on the academic side. And academic inclusion occurs when you imp implement uh, the accommodations uh, listed on a student's IEP, or when you select your own strategies to improve uh, academic outcomes for all your students. And even students without IEPs uh, need extra boosts periodically when they perhaps don't understand a concept or having difficulty um, mastering a skill. And while social and academic inclusion are very important, as I mentioned before, so is the relationship between the student and the teacher and that's built on uh, trust, but as well knowing your students. And remember that you're teaching students. Well, I know you're teaching curriculum, but you are teaching students and you need to know them in order to understand their strengths, interests, and challenges. And also remember uh, that it's important to understand that students may not remember everything you taught them. However, they will remember how you made them feel. So let's get started. 
you can see the agenda here. Uh, we're first of all uh, going to talk about inclusion and we're going to talk about uh, the process of reaching every student and understanding students' needs and it's a process. And we're going to apply that process to Alex, um, which is who, is who is our case study. And then at the end, I'm going to talk about some other key points, which is more of a, a summary of, um, some, of the I, some of the ideas as well as other ideas as well. But before we can begin talking about inclusion, I want to provide a brief overview of the book. Um, and in this book, there are sections on each type of exceptionality and in, in which the condition is described, uh, look for um, some of the um, things, the behaviors or some of the um, things that you should be looking for if you're looking, if you're seeking to um, find out if a student does have a particular exceptionality, as well as many strategies. And the book is filled with strategies for ensuring social and academic success. For example, for LDs, there are two lists of look for us for students for LDs, one for elementary and one for intermediate. As well, there are pages of strategies that work not only for students who have uh, learning disabilities or LDs, but for everyone. And I've personally used just about every one of these strategies, so I know they work. And there is a chapter on behavior uh, challenges, and that includes a list of 25 proven strategies on how to minimize behavior problems in your classroom. And these, all, these strategies all work, and I believe that it's important to have a lot of strategies, particularly when you're dealing with behavioral difficulties, because something that worked in the morning may not work in the afternoon. Likewise, something that worked uh, yesterday uh, may not work today. And as well, there is a chapter on students who have been identified as gifted and including uh, ways to support them academically and socially if, if it's required. And there are uh, various chapters on a range of exceptionalities that you're going to find in your uh, general education classroom. And I'd like to now talk about inclusion. Okay, Lionel. So what is inclusion? And I'm going to talk about inclusion in terms of uh, these four elements, exclusion, segregation, integration, and inclusion. So exclusion. Exclusion is uh, the upper left-hand quadrant. It occurs when students are prevented or uh, prevented from or denied access into a school uh, and education of any form. And usually it's because they have a disability or in some cases because they are a girl. Fortunately, it is not uh, generally the case in Canada. Segregation is, is the upper right uh, quadrant, and this occurs when education for students with special needs is provided in a separate environment. For example, a special school or perhaps a special class. In Ontario, we have some special schools. For example, there are schools for students with hearing impairment. And some boards have special classes for students with autism or intellectual disability. And uh, they also have some classes, some boards actually still have classes for students who are gifted. Integration is the bottom left. And integration is the process of physically placing students with special needs in an existing general education classroom. That is providing that the students uh, are able to adapt to the academic requirements of that particular classroom. Inclusion is the bottom right, and it is the practice of educating students with exceptionalities in the general education classroom, whereby the teacher makes changes in the environment, the curriculum, and the instructional and assessment methods to meet the academic and social needs of the students. Inclusion is also a philosophy or set of beliefs about the rights of people to function as much as possible, like others, and with supports. It involves more than physical placement of students uh, in a regular education uh, uh, classroom, and it involves social and academic inclusion. So that students with exceptionalities are full members of the class community. Uh, Lionel? So why is inclusion important? Well, research shows um, that for many students with exceptionalities, it improves the academic and social skills of students with special needs. 
It also improves the self-confidence of students with special needs. And research has also shown that students without disabilities develop understanding and empathy for their peers with exceptionalities. And that's borne out in, in many people's uh, personal experiences as well. And the last reason is, well, it's the right thing to do. Lionel? What are the challenges? Well, let's be realistic, folks. Meeting the needs of 25 students with varying abilities is difficult. It's, it's not easy, particularly if you happen to have eight students with um, IEPs, another eight students who uh, may have uh, various exceptionalities that are not yet diagnosed, and that pretty well takes up 16 of the 25 spots. So teaching to the middle is not really going to work. What you really need to be doing is thinking about the margins, because that's where many of your students uh, are, if that is the case. And it's not, um, and the other thing that you can't be doing is planning individual lessons for everybody. I mean, that just is not sustainable. So what I recommend strongly is that you use uh, differentiated instruction, or DI. And uh, in the book, there's an entire chapter on differentiated instruction, uh, strategies that you can use for differentiated instruction, and um, also a process for moving, uh, just starting out. If you're just starting out using DI, then you know how to start out, how to build on some of these strategies that you're using. And also there's a section in that chapter on a case study, uh, Leah, who actually used that strategy when she was uh, in her uh, one of her practica. So as well, besides the fact that you have a, a students with varying abilities and various uh, needs, the characteristics of some of your students with IEPs makes it challenging as well. And folks, I'm talking about students who have um, who who can become violent, and it has been shown that many times students become uh, violent, um, pushing over desks or or um, uh, throwing things, often it's because of fear, because of feeling anxious, um, also because of uh, frustration. And sometimes that can be, um, and also perhaps it's the teacher who didn't understand the triggers or wasn't aware of the triggers uh, of, of that student. And it's very difficult for, for teachers who are working alone without uh, an educational assistant to manage all of this and be aware of frustration levels and anxiety levels that you know seem to go up from zero to a hundred in you know within a, a matter of seconds, and of course having an IEP sorry having uh, an EA an educational assistant one on one you know uh, all day uh, is not always possible, and so it it falls on the um, on the on the shoulders of the teachers to to be able to manage those uh, those students and that's not easy. Teachers also need time to plan lessons and find strategies and resources. And folks, um, one way that you can plan your strategies is by looking at this book. And um, there are lots and lots of strategies in the book, and um, that will certainly help you in terms of planning the lessons. It's also nice to have support from administrators. Um, you need time, money, and moral support as well. Time to, uh, as I said before, plan the lesson. You need money for resources and uh, professional development. And it's also nice to know that your principal is supporting uh, what you're doing, moral support. You also need uh, to be able to collaborate not only with parents, but also with um, other professionals, such as uh, OTs, occupational therapists, or um, speech language pathologists, or maybe a consultant in your particular board. And you need time to be able to do that. And collaborating with parents can um, sometimes be a challenge with many parents, um, or at least some parents, let's put it this way, are eager to work with, with teachers and will share information. And parents and teachers can develop a a relationship, a two-way communication um, relationship. However, there are some parents who are reluctant to become engaged you know, with the teacher and the school, and it could be because they've had terrible memory. They have terrible memories of what went on in school for them, or it could be because they're from a, a culture where um, uh, 
basically it's the professionals look after education and parents don't have much of a role. Or it could also be because they're working three jobs to keep the family afloat. And they honestly don't have time for meetings uh, with you or and scant time to answer any of your, uh, respond to any of your emails as well. However, I want you to remember too that there are many parents and families who came to Canada specifically to get a better life for their family and also proper education for their, 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 their children. And they value education. And, you know, they may be doing work at home that you have no idea they're doing because it's hidden. And I'm thinking about the parents who say things to their, their children, things like, you know, stay in school, get yourself an education. Education is really important. And as it, you know, essentially they came uh, here to, for education. So they are invested in it. Some of them are, are invested in education. Now, the last challenge is the teacher's skill level. Teachers have concerns about inclusion. Uh, can I do it? Will the student, um, you know, perform the way, you know, according to expectations? Um, and the self-efficacy, can I make a positive difference in, with, with all of the, uh, the students? And, you know, it's really easy to say no. And I have to tell you, folks, personal experience here, um, Pembroke off asked me to do these webinars and I said, yes, of course I can do them. In fact, I can do three more. And the next day I thought, oh my God, what have I gotten myself into? And I thought, okay, I can always quit. I can always say no because, you know, there's enough lead time. I can say no. And I thought, no, you can't do that, Cheryl. You absolutely must carry through with this. And so I had, I tried to educate myself and I also tried to ask other people for assistance. And Gosh, uh, both of those worked, and I have to say I'm so grateful for the, the folks who, who gave me a hand. But all that to say is that if you are feeling a little concerned about um, inclusion and implementing some of the strategies, just take it slowly, educate yourself, um, practice within the, the confines of, of the privacy of your own classroom, and, and also reach out to other people for, for help as well. All right, Lionel. All right. So how do you do inclusion? So the way I see this, this is uh, a representation of inclusion uh, that I just quickly like to explain. So in this figure, the student is at the top. And I feel that you should uh, know each student's strengths, interests, and uh, challenges. And that's to inform your selection of social uh, goals and strategies, as well as academic goals and strategies. And that Folks, you know, when you're working with one student who may have um, uh, exceptionalities and you're working on strategies and goals, it has been my experience that many of these strategies are very useful for everyone. Okay, Lionel. All right. So how do you reach every student and make a positive difference in their lives? And for students with IEPs, you will have a sense of what their needs are, what their what the goals are. But you know, not all students have IEPs, uh, thankfully, and they sometimes need your help as well. And I believe it's important to know all your students so that you can understand their strengths, their interests, and their challenges. And I also believe that it's important to uh, formulate a goal, an informal goal for each of them. And the goal helps to focus your attention uh, on the student and um, providing with them with opportunities that will help, help them succeed. And um, for example, um, now, first of all, you're probably thinking, is she, does she think that I should have goals for every student? Well, yes, I do. But does it have to be done in the first week of the class of classes? No, of course not. If you can get to know your students uh, through, uh, you know, in, uh, throughout the uh, the first term, plan perhaps one or or two goals for each of them. For example, you know, capitalizing on their interests. I'm thinking of students who may be interested in soccer, and you can direct them to the sign up sheet for uh, intramurals. Or a student who is interested in uh, singing. Maybe you have a choir in your your school. I remember I just last week I I saw. Uh, 
I saw at Temple Grandin, you know, the person who is um, um, a leader in the area of autism. And uh, she was saying that, you know, even in elementary school, uh, she thrived on the various clubs and her teachers knew that she was interested interested in robotics and that's the club that she really enjoyed uh, being in so that's those are the kinds of things that i'm talking about also by having your um your goals um you may have to reformulate them periodically and we're going to see this later on uh this evening with alex our case study so how do you um how do you go through this process so first of all, know your students. So make observations, listen to them uh, talking with their peers, do check-ins with them, um, consult their files. It's really important to consult their files, especially their IEPs if they have one. Um, talk to parents if it's, if it's possible, talk to their previous teachers as well and gather information on them about their interests, their extracurricular activities, their family, uh, and also make observations about their academic um, skill levels as well. And then from that, you can set your goals. And as I just previously talked about goals, and you don't have to have, a, you know, a list that long of goals for each student. One goal is probably, or, or two, is probably sufficient to help you, as I say, guide those students into areas that, that uh, they may be um, interested in pursuing and will help them develop some of their academic and social skills as well, particularly for those students who may have trouble finding friends. So the next step is to find ways to meet these goals and seek strategies that are going to help you. And as I've mentioned before, um, this book provides you with many strategies to meet uh, the various goals that you may have. And then um, the next step is to implement the strategies. And you can do this um, very easily in your, in your classroom. And also um, when you're implementing them, uh, also um, just make some observations about how well they're working and whether they're working or not. And then finally review the plan and decide whether or not the goal has been met, whether you need to change some of the strategies or even part of the strategies, and or whether you should find a, um, a new strategy as well. And um, as I said, you know, you don't have to have <laughs> you don't have a, have to have a list of goals that long. Uh, one goal per student uh, is uh, helpful. And um, and get to know your students as as much as you can. And you want to make a positive difference in, in the lives of your students. And I believe that knowing them is the first step in making that positive difference in the lives of your students. And let's face it, folks, that's the number one reason you became a teacher. Lionel, please. This uh, slide shows um, the screening checklist for uh, on pages 45 and 46 in the book. And this is one way that you can make notes on a student, uh, on students when you are uh, trying to get to uh, know them and know their strengths. And you can see that there are language skills, math skills, and there are work study skills and other areas as well. And in the summary section, um, basically what I recommend is that you summarize their, their uh, strengths, their uh, interests and their challenges, and then formulate some goals. And this is just a, a template. If you can certainly um, use this a template and you can also customize it to meet your needs. You can add or delete uh, items in this particular uh, checklist as well. All righty, uh, Lionel, please. So let's just uh, sort of summarize what we talked about. Essentially, it seems to me that you need to know your students uh, as much as possible as, and um, as deeply as possible and know their strengths, their interests, their needs, and formulate some goals with them. Lionel? Okay, this is what we're going to do now is apply that process that I just talked about, that five-point process, to a case study on Alex. And I have to say, the, the grade three teacher had um, uh, uh, filled out a form similar to the one I, I just uh, showed you and uh, essentially had come up with one or two goals for Alex, and that was earlier in the, in the fall. However, things suddenly changed with Alex, and we're going to see, uh, learn about that right now. So in mid-November, 
um, Alex's activity levels had suddenly escalated and she was out of her seat. She was blurting out answers, talking constantly, arguing with peers, fighting at recess and arguing with the grade three teacher. And the students were starting to find Alex's behaviors intolerable. And so was a teacher who responded by nagging, threatening and raising her voice. And after a particular incident, the teacher felt she had lost control of Alex's behavior and decided that she, need, she needed to make changes to the original plan. So she sat down after school uh, one, one afternoon and wondered, okay, is it my problem? Is there something that I am doing now that is, that is causing these behaviors with Alex? And she gave some thought to and, and decided, well, no, generally not. Um, but maybe there are some things that I can do in terms of my instructional strategies that might make a change. And then she thought she considered some of Alex's behaviors and thought, well, has Alex suddenly developed ADHD? I mean, with the impulsivity, the, the um, movement, the excess of movement, and also the distractibility. And she said, no, <laughs> people don't just suddenly develop ADHD. But what she did realize is that sometimes uh, symptoms of, of anxiousness uh, can look like ADHD. And um, Evolve had been anxious about something and, and um, couldn't seem to focus. I'm sure you've had that situation. And it wasn't that you had suddenly developed uh, ADHD and were highly distractible. It's because you were anxious about something. And as soon as that passed, you were back to normal. So she wondered about that. And so to just to confirm some of her, 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 her hunches about Alex, she decided to make observations over a three-day period, and then she decided to prioritize some of the goals. Uh, um, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> so these are the uh, points that the teacher came up with in terms of Alex's strengths, interests, and um, her own concerns. So the strengths and the interests. Uh, Alex was had shown that she was quite athletic. And in fact, she was on a community swim team. She also had a vivid imagination and she wrote well and her stories, her creative writing was particularly uh, well done. And prior to the time now in mid-November, she had demonstrated reasonably good social and emotional skills. So there was a sudden change that was going on. And now um, the teacher was concerned about the fact that she was out of her seat. Alex was out of her seat 15 to 17 times a day. And so when you're out of your seat, you're not doing your work and work wasn't being completed. She was blurting out answers four to seven times a day, showing a lot of impulsivity, short attention span. She was distracted easily and she was talking excessively and she was starting to argue with peers and with me, me being uh, the grade three teacher and that in this particular case. So she took, uh, she decided to um, uh, come up with some um, goals. And before she actually implemented her plan, she talked to uh, Alex's uh, mother and explained, you know, the, the observations that she had made and wondered if there was anything that was going on uh, at home. And the mother was, was um, very happy to talk to her and had explained that, yes, she had noticed some changes in Alex's behavior, particularly uh, bullying her, her younger brother. And uh, it also uh, revealed that um, Alex's dad had had a heart condition that it was completely treatable, but it, you know, he was on the waiting list and uh, that perhaps Alex was concerned about that and maybe concerned about her, her father's health. So that was the, um, that is what happened before the teacher started uh, implementing her goals and, um, and her strategies. Lionel? So the teacher had some goals here, and it was, first of all, to decrease the out-of-seat behavior so that Alex could get her work done. And she also wanted to decrease the talking and the um, wandering as well, uh, uh, which is goal number one, and the, the arguing. But the teacher also had some goals for herself. She decided that, you know, let's be realistic, folks. When you have a student who's acting out all the time, misbehaving, uh, challenging your authority, it's hard to like them. And uh, she decided that she had to develop a more positive relationship with Alex um, 
make herself, you know, uh, take time for Alex and find out the good things in Alex and not just see the bad things. She also wanted to improve the curriculum planning and instructional strategies, class management, and discipline. And she felt it, figured that would help everyone. She realized as well that she was stuck in her ways. And, you know, it's hard to make a change because it sort of reveals that maybe your, your, your path wasn't the right path and that, you know, you should try to change things to improve things. And sometimes we get stuck and it's hard to change. And she also realized that she couldn't eliminate all of the behaviors, but she had to make them tolerable for herself and for the students. And also she wanted to keep Alex's social inclusion by peers intact. She didn't want the, the peers to be uh, rejecting Alec, Alex in any ways. Uh, Lionel, please. So here are some of the strategies that um, the teacher used to uh, address wandering. So one of the things, um, Alex seemed to want to move around a lot, so have lessons with movement, uh, where movement is part of, the, part of the lesson. For example, moving from one learning center to another. And she also allowed Alex and others to stand while working. And she also uh, started to try to use as many manipulatives as possible, so that even though Alex may not be physically moving or walking around. She's moving her hands. She also thought that by chunking assignments, um, that is breaking assignments into smaller pieces might be help helpful. Um, sometimes students are concerned when they see a massive assignment. They, they fear they can't do it. They become anxious. They're overwhelmed. Um, and sometimes they will act out in frustration or they may try to avoid them. And in this particular case, and in some cases rather, Alex was avoiding them. And so she was wandering around instead of doing her assignments. So the teacher decided to chunk the assignments and coupled that with praise and acknowledgement every time Alex completed a, a segment. And, you know, the acknowledgement can be just as simple as, I see you completed this section or whatever it happens to be. And she at times permitted Alex to get a drink of water, just a little break, a quick break in between uh, sections of the assignment. For example, a drink of water, if there was a, if the um, uh, water fountain was inside the classroom, you know, it would take one minute to get to the fountain and back. And the rules are no talking to others and no touching others as well. As well, um, she wanted Alex to try monitoring her own behaviors and using tally counts for each block of the day that she got out of her seat. And what I mean by tally counts, you know, you make those strokes, downward strokes, and you make four and then one uh, diagonal to count for five. And it helps um, Alex to realize that, yes, she is out of her seat quite a bit. And she also felt that it was important to reteach the class the rules on movement and not bothering others. And um, it's, she didn't want to center out Alex. And by reteaching everyone, um, that would help uh, provide a reminder to Alex as well. Um, next slide, please, Lionel. Um, with regard um, to the, um, the strategy of, uh, of um, talking, she felt that um, um, sometimes the excessive talking was bothersome to other students. And what she decided was to give Alex two desks or two tables, whatever the arrangement, you could use tables or desks. And one desk is at the front of the room for instruction and small group work. And another one is at the back for independent work. And it is not a punishment. And it is when uh, Alex finds and the teacher finds that she is not getting her work done and seems to be distracted or talking too much, she can just uh, move her stuff to the back of the room and work uh, um, there. And when I'd use this strategy, I uh, accompany the student with their work, set them up at the desk at the back and get them started, and then I go and visit them every five minutes or so just to ensure that they're on track and offer, offer encouragement um, as well. And um, so that's how that works. And I often, I also have had students who, um, who request to go to the back of the room 
to to work on um, on their work and um, in order to get it done. And as I said, it's not a punishment. You're not isolating the kid. This is just uh, you know a short period of time so the student can get the work done. Um, and the other thing that the teacher decided to do to uh, address talking was to plan more lessons involving small groups so that talking is part of the activity and the, the talk was actually focused on the, on the task. Lionel? So the next goal was arguing. And one of the things that Alex was arguing was about was, well, I don't want to do this. You know, you, you know I, I don't feel like doing this assignment or you know, that sort of thing. So one of the ways to avoid power struggles is to offer choices. Choices in terms of where you can work, with whom you can work, um, the order of the assignments that, that need to be tackled, that particular block, um, and also at, at choices with regard to assessment, choices in creative writing to appeal to interests uh, and strengths. And again, choices are useful for everyone because it decreases the, um, the power uh, struggles that, that can go on, and power struggles in this particular case with Alex meant arguing. Now, she also employed the broken record technique. So this is how it works, folks. So Alex would argue, 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 and she would say, in our class, we do our work. And she'd say that just like I did, very neutral and, and slowly, argue, 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 in our class, we do our work. Argue, argue, argue. In our class, we do our work. She never had to say it more than three times. And Alex realized she wasn't getting anywhere, and so uh, there was no point in arguing. And folks, I have seen this in question period in Parliament, where the Prime Minister has been asked a question that he didn't want to answer, and he used a, a you know, one of those boiler uh, plate responses. The, the opposition asked the question three times. He gave the same boiler plate, plate response, and then they went on to the next question. So that technique works with students, your children, as well as with adults as well. Now, one of the other things that um, was a source of contention was um, uh, with arguing and, you know, you, you're not choosing me, you know, when I, when I ask uh, uh, and, you know, want to answer a question. And, what, and also the blurting out aspects. The teacher realized that when she asked a question, she would just state the question and Alex would blurt out the answer and then argue because, you know, the teacher wouldn't pick her. So she trained herself to use the hands up rule and she trained herself to preface every question with, raise your hand if you can tell us, and then ask the question. And then as soon as Alex raised her hand, uh, she would call on her immediately. So folks, this technique really does work, that raise your hand, because I have to say in my first year of teaching, that's the exact same thing happened to me. And I thought, well, they don't know to raise their hand. And I thought, well, Cheryl, you haven't told them that's your expectation. So I had to train myself to use Raise your hand if you can tell us, blah, blah, blah. Now, the other things that uh, Alex, a teacher, did was to plan for a variety of activities in the lesson, such as small and large group uh, work, independent work, and offer choices. And the other thing that was a source of contention were the groups. There were times when students picked their own groups and Alex wasn't included. And you can imagine how humiliating that would be. So she started planning the groups and used, mix them up periodically as well. So planning the groups is uh, very important, not only for Alex, but for a lot of other kids who might not be selected um, in a group. And the other thing she used was VAC. There were times when um, the teacher would say, well, Alex, do you remember when we did blah, blah, blah? And Alex would say, no, I don't remember, and start arguing uh, on that basis. And VAC, you're probably thinking, well, what is VAC? VAC stands for Visual, Auditory, Kinesthetic, and Tactile. These are uh, the modalities we learn for the sensory modalities, and we learn through our sensory modalities. Our brains pick up information through our senses. And 
And then if they last long enough, if they're strong enough, they move into the uh, short-term memory. And if they can be held long enough there, they move into the long-term memory. So we start off with the sensor senses. So it's really important to use a multi-sensory approach. And I recommend VACT. Essentially, try to use a minimum of visual and auditory with every one of your presentations. And if you can get in the tactile uh, aspects, for example, manipulatives or perhaps in science, uh, getting kids actually doing things, um, dramatizing um, activities uh, for the kinesthetic, that's helpful as well. Okay, Lionel, please. Um, arguing continued, uh, use eye messages. Folks, I learned this life-altering strategy during my, um, between my first and second year of teaching. And um, it made a, a world of difference in, in my, uh, how I handle things uh, in classes. So when student is misbehaving, um, I would say things like, um, I, uh, I am concerned because blah, 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 and explain why I'm concerned. I would never use the you messages such as, you're always late, you never finish your work, you're always making a mess. And if that doesn't raise the hackles of anybody being accused uh, of, of, of doing these things and getting into a power struggle, I don't know what would. So using the I messages to express concern is a way of it telling the student that uh, you really are concerned about um, their behavior or their their um, social uh, interactions or their academic uh, 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 outcomes. And instead of escalating the situation like you would do with the you statements, you are bringing the situation down as well. So that's very important. So use the I messages. And uh, the other thing I have found very useful as well is to monitor behavior as much as possible to prevent arguments, particularly arguments among peers. So if you're there observing the students and sort of keeping an eye on them, uh, you'll find that um, some of these problems are prevented. As well, um, the teacher decided to provide as much individual assistance and feedback as possible. When we get feedback, that we are on the right track, it just reduces the anxiety level. And it also tends to motivate you, you because you know that you're doing things properly, that you're on the right track, and you're motivated to continue because you feel you can be successful. And so that feedback is very helpful in terms of reducing the uh, feelings of anxiousness. And then as well, give Alex opportunities to shine, perhaps in phys ed or other areas so that everybody can see her, her strengths. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the other things that the teacher wanted to do with regard to our arguing was to develop a stronger relationship with, with Alex, a stronger and positive relationship with Alex. She realized that she was just seeing Alex's deficiencies, her deficits, and she wanted to avoid that kind of, of situation. And so she really wanted to develop a more positive relationship with Alex. And she took um, steps to do that, such as con conducting daily check-ins uh, with, with Alex and talking to her informally um, about swimming, things that would interest Alex, and, and try to uh, develop, a, as I say, a positive and trusting relationship. She also wanted to review the types of emotions that we have and how to how to regulate them. And many of you are using um, so, uh, SEL, uh, social emotional learning programs. Some of them are formal programs like PATHS. Some of you teach uh, SEL skills informally. Uh, but in this particular case, she wanted to focus on emotions and how we can regulate them, for example, through meditation or deep breathing or... Um, taking a step back, uh, maybe taking a break, and um, uh, those kinds of very easy ways of regulating them. And she also, uh, you know, wanted to use um, uh, some programs such as, um, you know, uh, zones of regulation or, you know, some people also use a traffic light and you incorporate them into the, the program as well. And she also wanted to establish a signal for Alex to communicate to her that she needed a break. When Alex felt 
um, that her emotions, she was becoming overwhelmed uh, and she needed a break. Uh, she, A, was recognizing her emotions. And secondly, finding a way of dealing with them. And that was to communicate with the teacher that she needed a break. And that could be just be the old one minute, go get a drink uh, kind of thing. Or maybe it could be a two minute walk down the hall, do some deep breathing and come back within the two minute period. Okay, next slide, please. So um, the next stage in the process is to review the strategies. And so the teacher reflected on the strategies and how she implemented them and how they were working them, how they were working rather, and decided uh, which ones to continue, uh, which ones to adjust um, and tweak just a little bit better. And also if she needed to try something, uh, try something new in this case. All right, next slide, please. And I did emphasize at at the beginning of the case study that um, uh, Alex's teacher did contact um, the parents. And this working with parents was critical for the success of um, Alex and um, her, her, um, her situation. And this work did not, with Alex, did not entirely occur at uh, school. And as I mentioned before, the teacher reached out to the parents early in the process and established a, a respectful relationship. And the parents in this case were willing to col uh, collaborate with the teacher on the rewards. So this is how it worked. In Alex's agenda, Alex uh, received, if she had a good day, she would receive a, a happy face or a sticker or something like that. And uh, once the parents uh, saw that, they would provide her with a small reward at home. So she was actually being rewarded at school and at home. Now, these small rewards can be something as simple as perhaps a second story at bedtime or maybe a favorite um, dessert or maybe a, some kind of uh, activity after school that Alex really likes or something small. And, you know, because remember, this is going to happen every, hopefully every day and um, uh, until the point in time where she doesn't need it any longer. And uh, so you don't want to spend a lot of money on this, but the parents knew what motivated Alex and used that um, to um, provide a reward for, for Alex as well. And Alex knew that the, both the teacher and the parents were looking after her interests. And uh, the parents kept in contact and there was a two-way sharing of information. It wasn't just a one-way flow of information from the teacher to the, the parents. It was a two-way flow of information. And Alex was involved in some of the meetings, and I really strongly suggest that you involve your students from about grade three on in the parent-teacher interviews, because otherwise it seems as though the, the adults have come together and have made some kind of plan or that, you know, and the, the student is just being acted upon, and a, it's, the student needs to have some say in these kinds of things, uh, uh, these kinds of plans as well, particularly at the intermediate level. And unless the student uh, buys into it, uh, it won't uh, it won't work at all. Uh, next one, thanks. So here are some of the other uh, key points and a little bit of repetition as well. So the the key point that's not written on the slide is to basically know your students. That's where it all starts, knowing your students and developing a positive and trusting relationship with each one of them. And I also recommend too that you collaborate with other teachers, professionals, the administration, parents, and uh, EAs. The EAs for some students have accompanied them for quite a few years and they are very knowledgeable about uh, their, the students. So, you know, tap into their knowledge. And I might add about parents as well. You know, as teachers, we just see, we just have an episodic view of, of, the, of the students. And uh, as parents, they have a long-term relationship with the students. So they see the students in various um, situations and they know what works. I also suggest that you avoid deficit thinking as well. And that's what the teacher tried to do in this particular case. Instead of seeing just seeing Alex as just a, a source of irritation, she tried to develop a positive relationship and tried to avoid that deficit thinking. 
And also to be open to changing your strategies and learning uh, new ones as well, which is something that the, the teacher was willing to do. The other thing I suggest here when starting these strategies and in particular differentiated instruction, start small and think big. So start with one or two strategies, see how they work, and then just keep adding on and so you are incorporating as many as you possibly can at, at any one time. And maintain a positive attitude and effort. It's so easy to get down. And I know that teaching is hard. It's very hard work. And I know that some of you are coming home every night just emotionally exhausted. I understand that and I get that. But it's important to try to maintain that positive attitude and um, the effort. And um, it's also important to... Um, Take care of yourself, uh, that is physically as well as um, uh, mentally as well. You're, you know, obviously if you're sick, you're not going to go to school, but, you know, you need to men maintain your mental health as well. And if you're stressed, it shows up on the students. And you, I'm sure you know that, and you've seen that, that if you're, as I say, be, as I'll repeat, if you're stressed, the students see that and they become stressed as too. So one of the things, you know, try to relieve your stress in healthy ways, such as meditation or yoga or going for a walk or doing something for yourself every day that you enjoy. Even 15 minutes is probably sufficient uh, for that. And something that will help you, as I say, to reduce your stress in a very healthy way. So that's about it, folks. Um, Lionel, if you could move to the, the next uh, slide. That is basically um, the presentation for tonight. And I really do hope you picked up uh, a few strategies that, that might be helpful for you that you, you can try out tomorrow. And on maybe you have a student like Alex or um, some other students that are similar, but maybe not exactly the same. So I just want to tell you more about uh, the three webinars that are coming up. It's a series of three webinars, and we're going to explore social belonging, um, academic uh, belonging, and student behavior in more depth on the uh, dates that are uh, on the slide. The, the sessions are, they're one-hour sessions, and they start at 7. They're all on Thursday, just like uh, tonight. And there are, as you can see, two weeks apart. So it'll give you an opportunity to try out some of the strategies and uh, see how they work and then reflect on them as well. So the fee is $50, and that includes the three one-hour webinars and um, a copy, um, an e-copy of Finding a Place for Every Student. So, Lionel? No, oh, one more slide, one more slide. Yep. Oh, yeah, the, uh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> That's thanks great. so much for sticking around. Um, I know that you folks are busy and thank you for taking an hour out of your, your busy schedules. And as, as I said before, I hope you got something out of it and this was useful and uh, I hope to see you again. Thanks. Great. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Cheryl. Um, I know we just have a couple minutes left to go and we do have a draw for a, uh, uh, an e-copy of your book. But uh, just before just before we do that, uh, and this may be this is probably why there's three more sessions to follow here. Um, but uh, as you were talking and going through the the uh, your presentation, I'm sure all of us online here were kind of going back to you know we've all had that class right where it's like it's just it's all there and I was reflecting back to my great this is back when classes were streamed and it was called Science Nine Modified and there was no room so they put me in the sewing room. Oh no! <laughs> and. Uh, you know, it's and I know we have a lot of a lot of pre-service teachers here from time to time that come in. And I mean, I, I work so hard on that class. But honestly, the school was nine to 12. And I think it took four years before I felt like and I didn't teach them after that, but I'd see them in the hallways and that. But it just took so long to, to see these some some of them were there was a lot going on in their lives to, to you know, even to be able to sit down and talk with them. So. I know it was sort of implied within your presentation, but you know, sometimes this is, this is, this is a, what do you call it? It's not a sprint. It's a marathon in terms <laughs> of the process, you know, and especially if I'm new to the profession and I'm just starting, 
I'm not expected, you know, yes, inclusion is the right thing to do, but you're not going to nail it and get it perfect the first time. Is that a fair? Absolutely. It takes time and you will be fumbling around. I mean, let's be realistic. If you are a first year teacher, you're trying so hard to figure out uh, not only your students, but the curriculum. Lesson planning takes so much time. Uh, Just figuring out the various routines in the school. um, And also figuring out what works for you and what doesn't work for you. Um, It takes a lot of time. And, you know, it it also uh, takes time for uh, teachers who are changing a grade um, or changing totally um, a division as well. And, um, you know, your first year of doing anything is is difficult. I mean, let's be realistic about it because it – and the other thing I want to point out, too, is that changes don't happen automatically. Uh, sometimes they take a long time to happen. And there could be days when things, you know, days when things are going really well. This is certainly what I found, particularly when teaching in a a, a so-called behavior class. You know, you might have two days, two really good days, and then the next day it's like, whoa, what happened? happened? Exactly. (laughs) And uh, you're back, uh, you know, you know, not square one, but, you know, maybe even behind, and then you move up ahead, and hopefully you're making progress. And Progress can sometimes be very, very slow with some students, um, particularly if they have severe um, uh, exceptionalities. That's definitely something that I have found. That's And that's totally fair. So great. Well, thank you. I know we're just about at the end of our, our time here. And uh, just before, uh, before we do our lucky draw, uh, folks, you'll notice uh, on your screen has popped up an offer. There's a code. Pembroke Publishers is, uh, is very pleased to uh, offer a $5 discount on Cheryl's book, uh, Finding a Place for Every Student. Uh, you just need to, when you go through it at the end, when you check out the purchase is FPS 23. And if you put that in, it'll automatically take the, the $5 off. And again, if you don't want to click on that now, uh, that's at pembrokepublishers.com. You can access that. And then just before we close out, uh, we'll just quickly do our lucky draw. And basically for those of you that, uh, that this is new. Uh, we just have a little spinner and we draw from the audience and it'll spin through and we uh, we will see who our winner is, Jesse. So Jesse, congratulations. You are the winner of uh, a copy of Cheryl's book. We will uh, be contacting you tomorrow with information of how you can collect your prize. So uh, uh, congratulations for that. And again, thanks to everyone that joined us. Just a reminder, uh, we have a three-part session. Uh, you can register by going to pembrokepublishers.com. We'd love to see you over uh, the month of March, uh, February and into early March. Um, if you're like me tonight, as Cheryl was talking, as I was saying, man, there was a lot of things going on around just, you know, how can I improve my practice? And I think that's a lot of what you're talking about as well, Cheryl, in terms of the strategies. And yes, Alex was the story, but I think we've all had many Alexes in our in our classroom and so on behalf of everyone thank you so much for taking the time to to share your expertise and some of the thoughts in your book uh this evening so i'd just like to pass it back over to you to close us out for the evening well thanks very much and uh i'm just as i say delighted to have the opportunity to to uh to present this webinar tonight and um, as I said twice already, I really do hope that you found some of the, uh, the strategies uh, useful. And thanks for uh, spending the evening with us.